Would you please give a very large and lovely Leeds Beckett University welcome for the incomparable Miss Tracy Thorne. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit from Betsy Disco Queen just to kind of kick us off and get us started. Um, you might have read it anyway, but um, I will. Um, it's a bit from very early on in the book when I'm with the first band I ever joined called Stern Bobs, uh, where I was the guitarist. Not even the main guitarist, the second guitarist. And we were rehearsing one day in someone's bedroom and our singer didn't turn up, so the boys in the band turned to me. What about you, Trace? Can you sing? They asked. Could I sing? I had no idea. It had never occurred to me. I'd sung a bit at school in the choir, but it was hardly an Aretha-style gospel training. It was more that we got together at lunchtime in the music room and sang Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. Since I'd got into punk, I'd spent a lot of time singing along with records at home, but that didn't mean I knew what I sounded like. The singer I most wanted to sound like was Patti Smith, whose Horses album I'd played endlessly, but it was already clear to me that her style of singing required a level of confidence and assertiveness that I was pretty sure was beyond me. In fact, I was worried that any kind of singing ultimately demanded self-confidence more than anything else. Playing rhythm guitar in a band was one thing. It was quite easy to hide behind your guitar and behind what the other guitarist was playing. But being the singer put you fair and square in the middle of the stage and at the front of the whole band. I wasn't a natural show-off, so was that really where I wanted to be? At the same time, I was intrigued by the idea and flattered to be asked. Too embarrassed even to try, as long as everyone was looking at me, I made what was probably a fairly unique request. Um, I'll have a go, but I can't do it if you're all looking at me. Can I go inside the wardrobe and sing from there? <laughs> the others looked at me strangely, possibly beginning to worry about the apparent absence of any stage personality in this girl they had just recruited. But to their credit, they agreed, without killing themselves laughing, and so in I went. <laughs> From inside my hidey hole, I sang David Bowie's Rebel Rebel. I emerged to a very positive response, the others all declaring that I sounded like Susie Sue. I was trying very hard to, and while I was quite pleased with myself, I wasn't sure that I would be able to do it in front of an audience. We could hardly take the wardrobe around with us. <laughs> anyway, the strain of trying to sing like Susie had already given me a sore throat. So the very moment that opened my eyes to the possibility of being a singer was tinged with the disappointment of acknowledging that I would never be a Susie or a Patti Smith. And at that time, I wasn't really sure what other type of girl singers there were. The boys were disappointed, and I came away from the rehearsal wondering if I'd let them down. The thought worried away at me during the bus ride home. Why didn't I want it more? Or, not that exactly, for in many ways I really did want it, desperately. But why was I so ambivalent about the very concept of attention, both wanting and not wanting it? Making music is never just about making music. It's about being heard, fighting for your personal vision, your own version of events, to be listened to, given weight. It's about making people sit up and notice you and acknowledge your worth. But while I wanted all this, I seemed to want it in an invisible kind of way. I wanted to be heard without having to be heard, or perhaps more specifically, without having to be looked at. <laughs> you can see how it's going to be problematic. <laughs> so... From those, those, kind of, um, those kind of roots, mm. um, frankly, hiding in furniture, mm. um, how did you kind of make the step out of the wardrobe, the literal and metaphorical wardrobe, you know, onto the stage and, you know, playing guitar mm. and then stepping to the mic? Well, quite gradually and a little bit painfully, really. Mm. I never sang with that band. They never did persuade me to sing with them. Um, Although I think I got an inkling while I was playing on stages with them, playing guitar, that I would kind of like to have a go. And I was starting to be singing at home in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. uh, then I got into another band, the Marine Girls, where again, I wasn't really the singer. When we started, it was just me and one other girl, and she was the singer, and I just carried on playing my hopeless guitar. 
And then um, my friend Jane joined playing bass. And then her sister joined, who was also a singer. So now we've got two singers, neither of them are me. Mm -hmm. um, and as time went by, I started singing a bit with the Marine Girls. But there was always that sense that I wasn't the lead singer. And perhaps we actually didn't have a lead singer, because it was those sort of democratic days when yeah. the idea of posing as the lead singer seemed a bit egotistical. Yes. So we were all very democratic. You just you do a bit of singing on this one, we'd say. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll do a bit of singing on that one. But you know, no one. Well, that was the himself. spirit of the age a bit, it wasn't was. it? Like with the Gang of Four, they would exactly they would... lots of swapping and sharing. Yeah. Um, but you know that. So that went on for a couple of years. In the middle of which, I went up to Hull University, mm, of and course. that's when I met Ben. Yeah. Um, and he was aware of the Marine Girls, and so we sort of teamed up together. And in that context. You know, pretty early on, I think mm. we realised that he was a really great guitarist. Mm -hmm. I clearly wasn't. Um, he liked my singing, so we thought, well, it seems to make sense at this point, if we're going to work together, that the balance now becomes he plays the guitar, I do the singing. So sure. really that was the point at which I suppose I became what you'd call the lead singer. So it was a bit of a tortuous route. And, you know, there was never a moment when I actually joined a band thinking, I'm desperate to get to the front, I'm yeah. desperate to make yeah, this yeah. my career. <coughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it just sort of happened. But if, if you listen to the, the, the first Everything But The Girl record, which I think was a cover of Night and Day, is that yes. right, the Cole Porter yeah. tune? I mean, um, your singing on there is, is, is kind of fully realised, you know, to my, to my right. ears, then and now, rather than something which is tentative and, I mean, it has that quality to it and that's part of the appeal of it. But it's, 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 there's a difference, isn't there, between technique in singing and the yes. sound that one makes when one sings. Yeah, there is. I mean, I think a lot of that sort of that sound I'd come to, it was a bit, it had been bottled up up to mm. that point. I think I was actually trying it out at home in the privacy of my bedroom. Sure. And I tried it out a bit on the Marine Girls records, but sometimes it felt like it didn't really fit. Um, and I do think, however much I was hesitant and ambivalent about the sort of the showing off element of singing. Yeah, yeah. I think I was quite confident in a way about the fact that I thought I was making a nice noise. Mm. Um, mm. People have said to me about the book, oh, it's so self-deprecating, you know, you're so hard on yourself. And I think, well, I kind of am, but I'm sort of self-deprecating about the things I know I wasn't very good at. But mm -hmm. in all honesty, I am quite... <coughs> I think I'm quite honest about the things I thought I was okay at, and that yes, I could. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I, I guess the historical context to you and Ben meeting at Hull is that you were actually both signed to the same record label, weren't yes. you, at the time? Yes. But you didn't know each other, is that right? No, we'd never met at all. I mean, he lived in London, <coughs> and I lived out in the suburbs. So you know, when you're a teenager, that makes quite a difference. Sure. Uh, and he, you know, he. I don't know how he managed this. We're the same age, but he'd finished his A-levels and then done a gap year before we, <laughs> before we ended up meeting the university. Yeah. I don't know how that worked That takes all. some skill. I don't know how that worked. So during the year that I'd signed Cherry Red and I was, you know, with the Marine Girls, I was mm. still a schoolgirl, mm -hmm. whereas he was... He, I think there was a sense that he... I felt a bit that he'd already moved on a step further than me. Yeah. You know, he'd had, had this year in between. Yeah. And he was already actually a bit clearer about the fact that he wanted to do music. Right, because he, I mean, what, he came from a musical family, didn't he? His yes, father was his a big band a leader and, and yeah. so on. Yeah, and he was much more drawn to it. Yeah. Much yeah. less um, committed <laughs> to what he was actually studying at Hull. Right. He, quite, he was doing English and drama, and he quite enjoyed the drama side of it, because mm -hmm. there was sort of performance element. Yeah. But yeah. I was a complete swat. You know, I went up to Hull, just, you know, spent three years with my nose in a book. Do, well, this is what we like to hear. We're in a university, and this is what we like to hear. There you see, so I yeah, yeah. Just promote that to anyone. Whereas he was the opposite. He went up there, I think, just thinking, well, this is what you do, isn't you doss around at university for three years mm. and, mm. you know, try and form a band. Yeah. Which, which obviously we both ended up doing, yeah. but came at it from slightly different mm. angles. Yeah, yeah. So the, the first Everything But The Girl recordings came out on this label that you were already yes, attached to, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then the, the album that we spoke about earlier, mm. Eden, which has just had its 30th mm. birthday, yeah. um, that was through Warner Brothers, wasn't it? So well, clearly it was something had happened. For Cherry Red. Yeah, we recorded it for Cherry Red, because Mike Alway, who'd signed us both, he was this, this sort of maverick a &R guy who signed everyone to the, this little indie label. And so we, when we recorded Eden, we assumed it would be for Cherry Red and it would mm. we'd carry on in this indie world. Then in the meantime, he had this brilliant idea um, that he'd set up a new label 
along with two or three other really key people from the independent scene, Jeff Travis from Rough Trade being one of them, Dave McCulloch, who's a journalist, and they would get backing from a major label. I think everyone got a bit sort of frustrated about the limitations of the indie world. Mm. It's very easy in retrospect to idealise it and say, you know, it was very pure and wonderful, which it was, but I think we all began to feel there was a bit of a ceiling. Yeah. So they had the idea that they set up a label and that they just... <laughs> take the money from a major and nothing else. Yeah, great, that's going to work, isn't it? <laughs> because they won't want anything for their money, will they? Mm. So we ended up moving with him to the new label, Blanco and Negro, which was financed by Warners, as you say. Yeah. And, you know, that's where, in a way, some of the problems began, because without really knowing what we signed up for, yeah. we slightly unwittingly, I think, signed to a major label. Mm-hmm. Very, very early on. You know, sure. We were still just students. We'd, yeah. had no, we'd never been on tour We'd never really thought about whether we were signing up for a career in the music industry. Mm. And the day we left university, we had a single in the charts, you know, got on a train down to London to start recording something else, and there we were on a major label. Off you go, kids, it's yeah, your sure. career, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you can see, can't you, if you take, okay, the person who, you know, only two years before that is so frightened she's singing from inside a wardrobe, is suddenly on this path here, without mm-hmm. ever really, as young people don't, ever mm. having actually sat down and thought, is this what I want to do? Is it going to suit me? Am I the right person to do this? Yeah. Hence some of the problems that the book kind of the, the, outlines. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so um, the, the experience of everything but the girl in, in the, the music industry, once you were kind of, um, you know, in the belly of the beast, so mm. to speak. Um, what I was saying before about each album having that, you know, you, the, the kind of love, not money has a certain sound, yes. and then the Baby Star Sham Bright has a very definite, mm. you know, deliberate sound, then Idle Wild, it's kind of, you know, reduced again. Mm. I mean, were those, clearly there was decisions that, that, that you made, yes. and that, that, you know, that you and Ben made together. How did the, the record label feel about that zigzagging? Well, they felt, and they weren't wrong, <laughs> that it would be difficult to sell. Mm. We just thought, what a brilliant idea. You know, someone's giving the, you the opportunity to make another record. Well, don't make the one you've just made, because you've sure. made that one, yeah, yeah. so make a different one. We yeah. just thought yeah. that was our sort of light bulb thought. We mm. thought that's obviously what you'd do. Yeah. In retrospect, <laughs> I can see that that's really difficult from a marketing point of view. And it's also quite difficult from an audience's point of view. Um, you know, I respect and appreciate the fact that some of you out here will have bought one record after another, and that's great. We were aware that there were people who followed us on that journey. Um, But not everyone did. There Mm. were people who would perhaps buy one record, and then the next one would come out, and they'd think, what the hell have you done? Mm. You know, straight after Eden, you know, people thought, we've been put in this little new jazz box. You know, people thought we were maybe going to be a bit like Sade or this kind of thing. The record company did. That's what Mm. they thought they were buying. You know, Sade had just sold a million records and won a Brit for Best Album, so... Delivering Love Not Money wasn't really music to their ears. Mm, quite. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, in a way, I thought we were very lucky to get away with it as well as we did, mm. quite frankly, mm. and have a career mm. that at least kept its head above water, whilst yes. never achieving, certainly in the early days, what they hoped we'd achieve. You know, we, we kept afloat. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's quite something. Well, more than that. Well, I know, but in those days it was a bit easier. Yeah. We also had the benefit of living through an era of music when, you know, it was quite a thriving industry, mm. which it isn't now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how well it would work nowadays. Mm. Or whether it would be allowed to happen, particularly. Yeah, whether it would be allowed to happen, whether anyone would give you them. If you said on your third album, having already startled them with your second, <laughs> oh, now we think we'll get an orchestra in, and I'd yeah, like to be Dusty Springfield, please. Yes. You can, you can <laughs> imagine the meetings in their offices. Yeah. Well, they were yeah. as awful as you might imagine. Yeah. So, you know, going through that, that string of albums that... that um, Anybody who, who, who listened to everything but the girl, you know, kind of would recognise and, and uh, love. Um, what did that do to your singing? You know, singing over, you know, this great swelling, heroic Jim Webb type yeah. arrangement on the third album, or singing to, you know, Drum Machine and Ben's guitar on the fourth album. Mm. So, what does that do to, you know, your job, as it were, in the in the in the? Well, it had to change. I mean. I will mention now the fact that I've just written another book that's coming out next spring, which is about singing, partly because I realised in Bedsit Disco Queen that whilst it is a memoir about my music career, a lot of people said to me, you don't actually say much about singing. Because I was trying to sort of zip through it and tell funny stories and give a big overview. 
But I don't really go into it in that much detail. But I do in the new book. I talk in a mm. bit more detail. And, you know, one of the things that happened quite early on, really at the point we, we were just on with Eden, was we suddenly went out on tour. And I realised that the style of singing I'd developed in my bedroom, which was this very intimate, you know, close to the mic mm. kind of singing that worked very well and suited my voice very well, yeah. didn't translate brilliantly into a concert hall packed with students with a beer in one hand, yeah. you know, chatting yeah. a little bit between themselves, making yeah. a noise, perhaps fancying a dance, quite right to do so. Um, and so I had to try and make my voice kind of up its game yeah, yeah, a yeah, bit yeah, in, yeah. in those kind of circumstances. And then other records we went on to make, you know, the, the orchestral album, again, demanded a sort of bigger style of singing, mm. which I found quite exciting, <coughs> and I tried to um, rise to the challenge. but. Again, looking back, I can see that there are different moments in the career when I was singing in a way that particularly suited just what I was naturally good at, mm. and other times when I was trying to stretch myself. Yeah. Um, but when you know when you do that, you know when you like you're singing "Come on Home," which is a song yeah. everybody probably knows, <laughs> and you're going for the you know the end note yes. and so on, which is sort of uncharacteristic perhaps to how you would normally sing. Yeah. Do you do you get any kind of souvenirs of that kind of effort that you yeah. then sort of carry on into the well, what's while more I was natural in, to While you. I was in the middle of doing it, I did. I mean, there was a period when, you know, we were touring a lot and I was singing live a lot, when my voice did become stronger. And mm. it's a bit like, you know, the, the, one of the things I talk about in the new book is that singing very physical. Mm. There is a sort of athletic element to it. And being on tour is like training. Mm -hmm. You do it all the time. <coughs> you do get stronger. And I think sometimes when we were in the <coughs> middle of doing it, there'd always be a point when I'd be in kind of peak fitness. You know, and then like some awful footballer you've paid millions for, I'd then go and do the Achilles tendon because <laughs> I'd always get a cold halfway through every tour. Mm. Um, so there'd be about three gigs when I'd have warmed up nicely, you know, and I'd score a hat trick mm. <laughs> and it would all be brilliant. <laughs> and then I'd get injured. Yeah, yeah. And the rest yeah. of the season would be me just trying to keep fit because yeah. I'm, I, because fundamentally my voice didn't really have the stamina to cope with that. It was always, you know, this little hot house flower mm. sort of being forced. Um, to work in a bigger arena. Yeah, yeah. And I did really struggle with that, mm. which is one of the things that made me, in the end, again, have even more... I mean, I'll, I'm going to read a passage in a minute, which is about stage fright. And talking about a lot of my ambivalence about singing and my stage fright came from the fact that I did always know that there was a, an element of <laughs> something that could go wrong, because mm. I didn't entirely trust my voice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, you know, when you, you, you mentioned the... You know, the uh, or you're in the reading, rather, about um, your friends saying, oh, you sound a lot like Susie Sue, mm. being very approving <laughs> of that, and you saying that that was what you were trying to do. Yeah. Um, who at that, in the early days of, you know, uh, professional singing, were the singers that, you know, you, you took something from, that you took well, a bit from? Patty Smith, first of all, um, and that was... Um, partly, as I've only realised in recent years, I, you know, I always thought it was a sort of conceptual thing that I heard Patti Smith and just related to everything about her. But actually, I realised only in the last couple of years when I listened back to Horses again that it's pitched in exactly my range. Mm. L literally, the, oh, every little bit of it. She sings. She hasn't got a massive range either, and I certainly have. <coughs> and there's a couple of songs on that album which are just literally slap bang in the middle of where my voice sounds best. <coughs> and I used to sing along with it at home in my bedroom and it sounded great. So I thought it sounds great because me and Patty Smith, you know, we're like this, we just understand each other. <laughs> Whereas in fact, I think in retrospect, it's mm. a sort of accident of physiology that yeah, my voice yeah. happens to work on these notes as did hers. Yes. So I talk a lot about that in the new book as well, about this thing that we talk about inspiration mm. and influence. Mm. But for a singer, it's very bound up with just <coughs> your anatomy, you know, what yeah, yeah, the sure. physical sound that comes out of your body, which you only have so much control over. Mm. So Patti Smith was the first one, really. Um, and anyone who had, you know, women who had that sort of low range, Chrissy Hind, Elvis Costello as well is someone who oh, okay. I used to sing along with a well, lot. Well, you recorded it, at least days. one of his tunes, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. There's something about the timbre of his voice, which, again, I share some territory with. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite pure in some ways. There's a little tiny husk to it, and um, he was definitely someone who I sang with, along with a lot, although he's got a massive range, yeah, yeah, so I'd always yeah. go in and out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get to that point where you go, I can't sing yeah. this bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can join in again yeah. now. <laughs> 
So, I mean, you know, we're thinking about singing and we're thinking about, we're going to talk about uh, writing uh, as well in a minute. Yeah. Um, but I guess the kind of the bridge between those two things is, 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 is the lyric. Yeah. Now, you're an English literature first class graduate. Yeah. I understand. Yes. Um, and so you clearly have a, you know, an, an interest in the written word and mm. so on. But a lot of pop singing, like, for example, uh, Van Morrison, a favourite of mine, mm. a lot of his best vocal performances, you can't, you can't really discern what he's saying. What no. he's saying isn't really the point. No. It's the sound of it or the feel yes. of it. Whereas um, your style is, is, is very sort of literate in yes. some sense, isn't it? Yes. And does, does, how, how does that fit with your ambition? Well, it's just the way I do it, I've always mm. thought. I always used to think that me and Liz Fraser oh, were yeah. like the two yeah, yeah. sides of the coin yeah. uh, for that era of sort of where we came from. You know, we both yeah. grew up, I think, listening to the same kind of records. We yeah, both sure. came out, you know, doing sessions for John Peel. And she's someone I admired so much, you know, such an amazing singer. But what she does, I couldn't do in a million years. And mm. I suspect that what I do, she couldn't do in a million years. So, you know, if you put the two of us together, you get this sort of total idea of singing. But she's someone, again, where it's just all about the sound of the voice. Yeah. You know, people laugh Absolutely. at the Cocteau Twins lyrics and you just think, oh, for God's sake, you're missing the point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She was a great user of words for their sonic value. Yes, and, absolutely. Um, and, and so that's uh, something different. Yeah, and often I would imagine that you know, a transcription of, of um, I don't know, Kiko Buff might not reveal much. No, no, it wouldn't, and nor should it. You know, it's, um, you know, it, it sounds and... Yeah. Um, uh, early REM, I suppose, Michael yeah. Stipe did a yeah. similar kind of thing, didn't he, there? Yeah. Just using the sound of the voice. But I was always different. I mean, I, I have used lyrics, I think, to tell stories. Mm. And one of the reasons I put lyrics throughout the book um, was to sort of stake some claim as a, a writer all this time, because there is a thing when you're a singer that people seem to think, I don't know, they, they don't always wonder wh whether you've written it. Um, and so I was just kind of trying to point out some of the things I'd written, mm. as well yeah. as having been a singer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and they are also, you know, biographically Some of them are really aren't. biographical. I mean, that was interesting yeah. to me, that I picked some lyrics deliberately because they just sit so nicely with a chapter, and you think, this is a sort of diary approach to lyrics. And then yeah. others don't. They, they come from somewhere different. Yeah, yeah. But it was nice just to, you know, hang each chapter on Oh, absolutely. I mean, so like the story. Hatfield 1980, yeah, which is I know, quite a late that song. That works really it? well, and it's it great does. because I put it really early in the book, you know, describing the incident that it is about. Mm. But I actually didn't write, come to write that song until, what, well, going on for, you know, 15 years yeah. after the event. It, on Temperamental, the yeah, last, so the last actually, album. Yeah, so actually, even later, yeah. 18 years or so after yeah. the event. Yeah. So yeah. that's quite interesting to me as well, how you can end up coming back to something and, you know, you tell the story later on. Yeah, yeah. So um, if we, we're talking about writing. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you have uh, the Bedsit Disco Queen is already there, and we're going to hear some from um, your uh, next book, the book on singing, shortly. But um, you're doing all sorts of different writing, mm. aren't you, at the moment? Yes. Tell us, tell us about that. <laughs> well, I'm just saying yes to things at the moment. Yeah. Um, having always been someone who had a tendency to say no to things and, you know, sort of back off a bit, going, oh, no, I haven't done that before, that's scary. So having, you know, written... Bedsit Disco Queen, I realised that I enjoyed the process of writing. And so then I went straight on and wrote another book. But I'd actually finished that, this, this second book, over this summer. Mm -hmm. And just before that, I got asked to write a column for the New Statesman. Um, and again, my, my initial instinct was to say, no, I can't do that, that's too scary. And I just thought, well, no, just try it, you know, say mm -hmm. yes. Because as much as anything, it's just a discipline that you have to write something. They actually wanted me to do a weekly one, and I did shy away from that and say, can I make it fortnightly, mm. um, just to ease the deadline a bit. But it's just that sense of having something that you have to keep working to, so it just sort of keeps your hand in. Yeah, yeah. Is there some correspondence between writing that sort of thing and, you know, writing a song lyric? Yes, the, the I think The compression of it? I think... I mean, we've talked about this before, that I think I'm, I always err on the side of compactness mm. and minimalism, which suits songwriting very well. And, and uh, well, my kind of song, I mean, some people write long, verbose um, lyrics, you know, verse after verse after yeah, verse. I've yeah. never done that. My, if you look at my lyrics on the page, they're little mm. and quite concise. There'll be a line, usually, that is the sort of key line of the song. You know, that's yeah. just the way yeah. I see things. Yeah. So... 
you know, songwriting works for me. When I've been writing books, the thing I've struggled with most is making them long enough because I have a tendency to just mm. want to keep it moving and get to the point yeah. and not bore anyone. Um, so a column works really well for that because you've got a very precise word limit. And so does Twitter. Mm. People wonder why I like Twitter so much. Mm. Well, it's a gift to writers, I uh -huh. think. If you have a taste for being concise with the written word, yes. how on earth could you not like Twitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is very brief, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's very brief. It's lovely. I love it. Yeah. You literally have Telegraphic. To, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you've got just something to say, a bit of information to impart, sometimes mm. you do it over two or three... Tw I'm not saying every tweet has... It's like a little haiku, you know, <laughs> that would be incredibly pretentious. But on the other hand, there is something about just being sure. communicative. And yeah. it's, it's a good opportunity to be witty, yeah. because if, you know, brevity is the sort of wit, then there is something mm. about that thing of making a comment on either something that's just happened to you or something you've just seen on the telly. Yeah. And, you know, I love other people's doing it as well. It's not that I just sit there reveling in my own tweets. Yeah. Oh, I'm so clever, I'm so funny. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I love it is because I love reading everyone else's. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, just uh, we, we won't go too deep into it because we'll no. just go off on one. <laughs> but we have a, a shared interest in uh, Samuel Beckett. Yes. Um, mm. And I suppose, you know, kind of brevity and it's yeah. late prose and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I did my, well, I talked about this in the book, actually. I did my MA on the Beckett trilogy, mm. um, which are wonderful, just, you know, little gifts to a minimalist. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a, a, a kind of discipline, as you say, you know, yes. like write it to a word limit, a specific subject, yeah. you know, by a specific time. Yes. Um, yeah. You're also um, involved in writing for film now. Is that well, right? Different yeah, sort of language. I've done um, one film that um, I did the music for earlier this year, which is the new film from Carol Morley, if anyone knows her. Who <coughs> up till now has just done some documentaries, two documentaries mm. and some uh, work she did at college. And this is her first uh, drama feature film. And she approached me earlier this year, go, we'd actually met a couple of times and liked each other, mm. uh, and I loved her films, and she asked me if I'd do the soundtrack, to which my response, as it always is, was, no, that's <laughs> too scary, mm. <laughs> you're getting the picture. Um, and I said, I don't know how to do a soundtrack, and she said, yeah, good, that's perfect, that's what we want. Mm. Um, which actually appealed to me, I like yeah. anyone who gives you that as your... So is it is it like a like a like a score you know like Randy not Newman remotely, style no, thing? No, I said I can't I can't do a score, and I said there's not a lot of point either in me composing some instrumental music, is there? I'm not renowned as an instrumentalist. I don't think anyone's going to um, be overexcited at the thought of me playing guitar all over your film. <laughs> Whereas they might be more interested in me singing. Mm. So I said, you know, would it work if I just write some songs? So that's what I've done. I've written basically little, they're almost, when you see the film, and they are very dominant in the film, I went to the premiere at the weekend and was sitting in the big screen at the yeah. Odeon West End going, oh Is my it? god, I'm That's a familiar voice. everywhere. Who's that? Um, but they're like this little one and a half minute um, snippets of songs, mm. which was fantastic. I mean, it was really liberating. You don't have to actually finish this piece. It doesn't have to be four minutes long. It doesn't have to have mm. a chorus or a hook. Um, when you're working on someone else's project, you've got sort of a a direction set for you, which is the hardest thing in mm. coming up with any new idea for a piece of work. Why am I doing this? Where's it going? And what's my direction? Yeah. So if someone else comes to you with a project and says, this is the story, this is the film, then immediately you've got some inspiration. Mm -hmm. Got something to work yeah. with. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, I said this to you earlier, I'm in this sort of frame of mind at the moment of just thinking, I'm very receptive to offers, <laughs> people coming to me asking mm. me to do things, rather mm -hmm. than where it used to be, I used to feel a great pressure to keep things coming, you know, oh God, it's been 18 months yeah. since your last album, you've got to have a new album, some of which is just commercial pressure mm. when you're in that um, situation, which I'm not in anymore, I don't mm. have any of that mm. pressure. So I'm just enjoying actually seeing what appears. Seeing what comes to yeah, you. And yeah, and trying to say yes to things and trying to make them work and just doing a variety of interesting things rather than getting stuck in this rut of yeah, sure. this is what you do. Which is what, what I, I think you want to avoid, isn't yeah. it, really? Yeah, Very keep, much. You have to try and keep your life interesting. Yeah. And, and so those, those little 90-second pieces yeah. um, for, for this film, you know, they are quite columnar, aren't they? They're quite they like are, those again, they're, columns. They're little minimalist pieces. Yeah. Um, 
I will, like Beckett, just end up making everything shorter and shorter. And my final release will just yeah. be silence. That's right, fantastic. <laughs> well, I think it's been done, sadly. Yes. But, but it's uh, a damn good idea. idea. <laughs> yeah, OK. Now, my fees are usually £95 an hour. But I'm going to yes. ask, all those things that you were talking about, that you, you were worrying about forgetting words or, you know, like something going wrong on stage. Yes. Are they grounded in fact in any way has anything like that ever happened yeah they are started it off yeah i mean i touched on this earlier you know and i do go on in that chapter to talk about the fact that stage fright isn't just this sort of nebulous condition quite often there is a a basis Mm. and in my case it was to do with stamina and vocal strength and power you know we did awful gigs sometimes when we were playing with a big band and i just couldn't project my voice loud enough so you'd have people in the audience shouting, turn the vogel up, mm. like it was that easy. Mm. You know, like yeah, the sound yeah, man yeah, can just yeah. push it up endlessly and yeah. you won't get a howl of feedback, which often we did. Mm-hmm. So if you're on the stage and you can hear people out there shouting, turn the vogel up, and you, mm. you don't hear, oh, the sound man's doing something wrong. You hear, I'm not loud enough, I'm not good enough. Yeah. Um, so I do think those kind of things, you just didn't have a good effect on me. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I sort of stepped out of the, the world in which I perhaps could have done it. And ironically, if we'd yeah. never become successful <laughs> and I'd stayed, you know, working in little tiny clubs mm. on little stages, mm. and, you know, perhaps doing <coughs> acoustic music quite quietly, I might have been able to cope. Yeah. But yeah. ironically, the success we have and, and the fact that we were quite ambitious in the studio. So we mm. made records that stretched Absolutely. the limits yeah. and then had to go on tour and try and replicate them live. Yeah. Yeah. You know, put me in a position where I sometimes felt, I just can't really do this. Yeah. But I remember so. going to see you and, and Ben playing, I can't remember the theatre now, in the West End. And it was just yes. the two of you. Yes. And it's pin we, drop quiet. Yeah, no, no, we did return to doing those yeah. things. The trouble with those gigs, and this is awful and no one will like me for saying this, um, but from the point of view of the performer, they can be a bit boring. (laughs) You know, I'm contrary, aren't I? I want everything. Because really what I'd like to be is the kind of singer who struts about the stage shouting and everyone out in the audience is pogoing and Mm -hmm. being pissed. Yeah, like Pauline Murray. That's what I'd like to be. Yeah. But I can't really do that. So in order to make it work, we had to do gigs that are like recitals. Mm. Um, which are fine, but yeah. you know. But that's because boring. that's because people. <laughs> that's because people love the music and are yeah, respectful of it, isn't I know, it? I know, I know, and that's rather than you know they don't have any. I don't mean re- to imply I never enjoyed it. those gigs. That would be exaggerating. Mm. But I think in the end, um, my appetite for it just ran out. Mm. I think after years and years of of trying to find different ways of making it work, and. You know, perhaps realising that the side of it that had got me excited about music in the first place yeah. was never going to be something yeah, I was yeah. great at. But yeah. I could, you know, carry on doing this. But then, I don't know, in the end I just felt I'd sort of done enough of it. So, yeah. you know, I talk about stage fright and that's a, that is a true element as, as to why I don't perform mm. live anymore. But mm. there is also the sense that I think, you know, if I were to really confront the stage fright, I'd need an enormous amount of motivation. Yeah which would come from the desire to do it. Mm. And at the moment, that's just not powerful enough. Mm -hmm. So would you, I mean, I'm just going to come back to something about that in a second, but you Mm. just put this other thought in my mind. The writing that you're doing, is that displacing the musical impulse? Or is it just, Um, you know, barging it out of the way a little bit? Not entirely. With me, things come and go anyway. The musical impulse in me is never constant. Mm. Sometimes, I, you know, I've been through long phases in my life. When I stopped for a while to have the kids, yeah. I really did stop completely. Yeah. I mean, we released um, the Temperamental album, I think, in about 2000. But, you know, my input in that was tiny. Mm. I wasn't massively involved. I wrote a few lyrics on it. Ben did an awful lot of work on that. And then I didn't do another record until I came back and did my solo record out of the woods in about 2006 or so. So there was about seven years when I really didn't do any, and I really didn't. No, so you weren't kind of stockpiling songs. songs Not at all. mm. Um, And so in a way, I I felt during that period that maybe I had stopped completely and that was it. I just look back and think I was in a band when I was young and then I stopped. So I'm quite grateful that actually it's come back Mm. even as much as it has. And I know sometimes people say to me, oh, we wish you'd record more, we wish you'd go on tour. And I think, well, I know, but on the other hand, you know, to me it's slightly amazing that I'm doing it at all. And, Mm. you know, I've gone back to making some records, 
you know, and I do little bits here and there. I've done this film music. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it feels like music is at least back in my life. So yeah. when you talk about the writing, I'm, I'm also really happy now to have writing in my life because that yeah. feels like something that actually allows me to be a bit the person I maybe I always would have been when I came out of university. That might have been the path I was going down. Right. But actually in, went off on a different tack. Yeah, yeah. So I feel now that I'm having the opportunity to slightly explore that, mm. that route that I didn't do they, do they? Do they help you kind of un understand each other, the music and the writing? Is it, is, is it like a Venn diagram thing where they, they influence <laughs> they each other? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, or that they inform each other, not necessarily that they overlap, but that the, there's a shared I suppose they do a bit. Element. Ben element. says to me when he reads my columns, mm. he says, these are like your songs. Because I can imagine <laughs> you singing them. Because there is a sort of, and I know what he means, yeah. there is a sort of, there's, you know, you do sort of fall into a style. It's just to do with the way you see the world and sure. the tone of voice in which you talk about things. Yeah, and yeah. There is a through line. I yeah. can see that. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. like I've suddenly just put on a different hat and become a different person. No, absolutely, that's right. Yeah, so that's there right. is a connection. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, you mentioned Liz Fraser, Elizabeth Fraser mm. from the Cocteau Twins, who um, hasn't yet, has she? She hasn't. She made... did do a gig. Did she? A couple of years ago, which yeah. I missed. Oh, okay. She did one gig on the South Bank, um, and again, she hasn't come back and done any more. I don't know. Right, was that part of one of those, uh, those curated things? things. Yeah, yeah, the meltdown thing. I tried to get in touch with her for my singing book, because in the book I interview two or three people. There's oh, little you chats. Yeah. I talked to Romy Madlycroft from The XX, because oh, right. she's someone who I feel a great sort of kinship with. Mm. Um, I interviewed Green Gartside, because I thought he'd been um, brainy. Yeah, he went, he went, to, <laughs> he went to college he just is. down here. He's great, he says some hilarious things, mm. I have to say. He's very funny. Yeah. Um, I have a chat with Alison Moyer at the end of the book. Oh, did you? And she provides a couple of insights that prove a kind of conclusion to it. Yes. Um, and I also talked to Linda Thompson oh, about brilliant. her vocal dysphonia. Because mm. I'm interested in other people who stopped. Yes. There's lots in the book about other people. Who, there's, there's lots in the book about other people who have problems with singing. There's a chapter about Dusty Springfield. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter about Karen Carpenter. Yeah. There's a chapter about Scott Walker. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm looking at people who I, A, admire massively, but who haven't found singing just a walk in the park mm -hmm. for various different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to Liz Fraser. There would have been a whole chapter about Liz Fraser, but she was as elusive as she ever is. I managed to actually get an email for her and had a couple of email exchanges with her, the last one of which just sort of ended with her saying, I'll get back to you! <laughs> <laughs> Silence! <Yeah. laughs> I thought, OK. Yeah. I mean, she does. I think she's one of those people who doesn't really like talking about it very much. She yeah. doesn't have any great appetite for analysing it and picking it apart. Mm, but yeah. I would have liked to have actually um, had her in there as a representative of something, because she did feel to me, during the 80s especially, like my sort of counterpart. I really mm, did have a mm. sense that there was me and then there was Liz Fraser and we were doing something completely different. But I, you, you do sort of have a sense of people who you feel slightly shadow you or... Yeah, yeah. I don't know, you just have but some connection with You know, what, what I was, we were saying downstairs before, actually, <coughs> that, you know, the, the, the difference between the, the, the tutored singing and the sound that one naturally makes. Yes. Um, and, you know, that you were saying, well, that, that's the sound that I make, you know, I've yeah. learned to use it and train it and so on. And somebody like Liz Fraser it, it almost invented a new, a new way of singing, she didn't did. she? Actually, yeah. you know, the, how you use sound. Yeah. Certainly for a female book. Yes. And also she changed her singing. Mm. I mean, she's someone very interesting who I think, if you listen back to the early records and then listen to the later stuff, she started using an entirely different part of her voice. Mm. I mean, in her later work, she's gone almost in, exclusively into her falsetto range, yeah. which... It's interesting. You know, yeah, yeah. I would have loved to have yeah. pinned her down on yeah, that. Yeah, that's, right, that's right. Looked at it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like you say, it's a physical thing, isn't it? It's like yeah. where you're holding your yeah. head, or you know, where is the yeah. sound coming from? I mean, I do talk about a lot about, about this idea that there's two aspects to the sound of your voice. There's one that's sort of given; there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. But there is also a lot more thinking going on than people think. I do mm. get a bit frustrated sometimes mm. when people talk about singing as though it's just a sort of emotional outpouring, and mm. you know. 
um, that it's not the same as being an artist or a musician. There's some great um, facts I uncovered. Up until about 1979, singers weren't allowed to become members of the American Federation of Music. Exactly. They weren't counted as real musicians. <laughs> um, and back in the days of the crooners, mm. like the crooners who used to sing with bands, they always had to have an instrument because no one could take them seriously. Just So Bing Crosby was given like a guitar with rubber strings on just yeah. to hold in pictures. Right, so it looked you like the you real can't, can't just be a singer, you know, yeah, that's nothing. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of make claims as well for singers to be considered as artists, that there is actually yeah. conscious choice going on and yes, decisions absolutely. being made about how yeah. you sing, yeah, which yeah. get a bit devalued. Well, that's right. I mean, the, 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 the playing an, an instrument is the same, isn't it? The physiological yes. element, you know, how broad are your hands on the that's piano true. keyboard that's or true. something. That's true. There is, and, there uh, is an aspect and, of that um, as well. So you've got the yeah, aesthetic. Yeah, there is limitations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm now going to slip into Dimbleby mode. And I am going to invite, in fact, positively welcome uh, questions from our number. So, yes, madam, please lead off. I really, really loved the column that you did about Kate Bush. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really captured how a lot of us felt about it, I think. And one of the reasons why Kate stopped, I think, like, was because she had Bertie, her son, and he's also sort of why she came back. Yeah. She makes it very clear that that's why she ended up back on the stage yeah. and sort of dragged her there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she put him into her last two albums and then he's very big in the stage show. So I just yeah. have two little mini questions in that way. Uh, one is, would your kids ever fetch up in your music? And um, the other one is, did singing to your kids change how you felt about singing at all? Well, the answer to the first bit is they actually have fetched up in my music already on... Um, a Christmas song I did a couple of years ago called Joy and there's a bit at the end where I wanted um, it to sound like a group of carol singers doing the backing verse just sort of going ah! and I thought well if I get proper singers in they're gonna it's gonna sound too singery so I said to the kids can you just come and sing ah and they were really resistant I think I had to give them each pound <laughs> Um, and I said, honestly, I, you're not going to be like solo, no one's going to know it's you, except I'll put your name on the album. Um, but I just want you to pretend, you know, put a scarf and a hat on and pretend you're being carol singers. I just want that sound of sort of kids' voices. So that's them singing on the it's album. Not that's you on. Just put them on the <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no. But yeah, you're right, I did sing to them when they were little. That was the only singing I did during those years. But that didn't feel like singing, singing, that just felt. Domestic. I just wonder because I feel awkward when I sing to children, even though yeah. I'm a singer when I sing. Well, I used to feel awkward when I used to go to play groups with them, and you know, we all sit down to sing Wheels on the Bus, and people would look at me going, Tracy <laughs> <laughs> She's going to sing Wheels on the Bus. It's going to be amazing. And then I'd just like, Wheels on the Bus, yeah. going like everyone else. They'd yeah. go, So disappointing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I can still do all the gestures. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Another question. Yes, madam. Uh, I had a similar sort of a question in a similar vein. Um, my teenage daughter thinks that my musical pursuits are so uncool. Um, and I just wondered what yours thought, you know, at what point did you tell them that actually mm. you'd been famous or you know, what did they think of it? They kind of absorbed the knowledge gradually, I think. When they were little, they really didn't understand at all. Because as I say, I wasn't working when they were little. They had no concept of that. I was, you know, mum and I was at home. You know, there were a couple of instances when things happened, like I'd have to, have to sign an autograph in front of them, and then they'd go, why, you know, why does that lady want your name written down? <laughs> and I, so I'd sort of have conversations with them along the lines of, well, you know, mummy and daddy used to sing, and I used to be a bit famous and be on the telly, and they'd go, and what's for tea? <laughs> because you know, that's how interested kids are in anything. So they just kind of learned about it gradually. And then I, st I sort of returned to music, um, how long ago? About seven years ago. So I guess they were still young. But again, I, I did it all, you know, while they were at school, and sort of <laughs> in the way that mums do part-time work, you just sort of do it so that it doesn't get in the way of anything. And so even when I returned to music, I still did it a bit like that, just trying to fit it in around everything. So in all honesty, I mean, they're teenagers now. My girls are 16 and Blake's 13. So they're, they're very aware now <coughs> of, um, you know, the work I've done and the work that Ben's done. And actually quite respectful, bless them. Great. <coughs> They've never really had to actually live with it as a sort of big career. You know, it's not like we were touring a lot or on the telly all the time. So I think... 
you know, in a way it's been quite easy for them just to think, well, that's something that happened in the past. Mum and Dad used to do that and we don't need to talk about it. <laughs> um, but actually they're old enough now to think it's quite cool that they can say, you know, when people say, what do your parents do? They can go, well, they used to be a band and now they write books and my dad DJs and stuff like that. You know, it's all kind of good. Mm. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Music being a collaborative effort with yourself and Ben, mm. how much of a part did Ben play in your writing of Disco Bed Sit Queen? Was it kept very much close to your chest? Mm. Or did you ever let him see a draft? Or? That's a good question, actually. I, I was quite shy of it all when I was writing it. I mean, I, t I went to him at the beginning, obviously, and said, I think I'm going to write a book about, you know, my career, which means our career. <laughs> How do you feel about that? And he went, no, no, do it. It'll be great. Because I know but, you were just saying about the columns, how we yes. read them and the rhythm in the columns. And how yeah. Them. And I just wondered, with, because like you said, the story is half as much his. I know. And I just wondered if, if ever you was discussing that over the... Well, I showed him the book when I thought I'd finished. And <coughs> this is interesting. The most telling thing he said which I think was A, incredibly astute, and B, incredibly generous, was that he said to me, the book's fantastic, but the first 50% of it is all, I did this, and I thought this, and I thought that, because it's you telling your story. He said, and then from the point, well, he said, then from the point where we meet and we start working, you start saying we. He said, and it just doesn't work. You can't write a memoir that says, we did this, we thought that, we decided that. He said, you've got to keep it in the first person. Yes. And I said, but that feels unfair, because it feels yeah. like I'm mm. claiming credit for every decision. He said, no, 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 don't worry, that's we, I, I know what we decided between us, is put, put it all in the first person. Yeah. Which I did, and he was right from the point of view of the book. Um, but I just think that was very generous. I mean, at the end of the book, I do thank him for letting yeah, me yeah, tell a story that's part of yeah. his, as though it was yeah. all mine. So. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, dance music is a big influence in the later Everything But The Girl bands, especially the Council mm. I'm just wondering, is that your influence or is Ben a keen dance musician, enthusiast? Well, Ben's been keener really and more knowledgeable in that he you know, took up DJing, so actually it became a massive part of his and then ran a dance label for years, Buzz and Fly. So for a long time it was a massive part of his life, perhaps a bit less so now. Um, for me, I've always been, it's been something where it's always been collaborative. You know, I have no ability to construct a dance track at all. So I've only ever been the voice on top. But actually, I've always found that quite exciting. And the collaborations I did on Out of the Woods were very much me approaching people whose stuff I liked and saying, should we do something together? And then them actually constructing the music and me singing. I still actually really love doing that. And it's something I would quite like to do again. And I also like the fact that then when you do a track like that, it has a life out there in the world. You know, it can get played on dance floors. And I can be at home sitting on my sofa with a cup of tea, with my feet up, which is where I like to be. <laughs> but I'm singing out on a dance floor song, which is great. So the record can go and do all the work. Yeah, so when Massive Attack like asked that. you to do those, to put the vocals on those tracks yeah. of protection, was, the, was, was that how it was? The track was made and then you went in and... Well, protection was was almost nothing when they sent it to mm. me. I mean, it was, it was an idea for a concept that might be developed into a notion of a track, <laughs> literally. <laughs> right, OK. You know. So you were in there right at the very beginning yeah, that for that. Was, yeah. Yeah. But that's how they work. Mm. And to be fair, it, there is a, a quality to their records that hangs on to that mm. feeling that this is mm. an idea that might be developed into a song, yeah. which I actually like about yeah, them. Yeah, there's yeah, always yeah. that sort of, well, there's is this quite finished? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which creates a real tension. Yeah in their stuff. Um, but yes, they sent me things. And other tracks, you know, we did work on other songs that didn't mm. actually get finished and didn't quite work. Mm. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was fun. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, you mentioned Hull a couple of times. Could you just sum up how you feel about Hull as a city? <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> sensing I'm going to have to be very positive. <laughs> Influenced you and whether you go back, and you know how important is it as a place? It did influence me massively because <coughs> it was the place where I went to when I first left home. Like anywhere that you leave to go to college, you know, it's to me, it's where a lot of my memories of you know first being away from home and living on my own that's where they live, they live in Hull. I haven't been back that much. I actually went back for the first time in ages last year to do a book event 
which was lovely actually and um, a couple of my old university lecturers came along and that was really nice uh, but there is something you know when you leave university there is a feeling often that you do sort of just package it up and that was that mm. part of your life and you almost can't go back I feel a, a, a resistance to going back actually because I feel it will make me nostalgic in a slightly unhappy way that I'd look back and think oh it's all over it's so long ago mm. we're so old <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I loved it, um, and I thought it was, a, you know, it was an amazing university. It, people are a bit sneery about it. Well, people sneery about Hull in general, obviously. It's one of those yeah. crap towns, supposedly, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. Which it so isn't. No. Um, and in your early stuff, do you sort of name check it and all the allusions to things that, <coughs> you know, are whole things? <coughs> yeah, there's, there's street addresses and things. I yeah. Think, <laughs> Places I lived, yeah. 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 Yes. Tracy, um, I find your lyrics very clever, and I've, I'm similar age to you, and, and so um, I've identified with them as, as I got older. Um, I believe I saw um, a picture that you um, put on Twitter, I think, or someone put on Twitter, where you your, your lyrics were quoted in graffiti, um, oh, like yeah. the. Uh, the, like Desert's Mr. Rain, that's right. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in Italy it was. Yes, yes. Yeah. How do you f have, have you seen yourself quoted and how do you feel about that? Because in a way, um, to my generation, but also to, to, to younger women, you are a role model. Aww. So, so how, how, how do you feel that's about your thanks. lyrics being well, used and quoted? That was a, The graffiti one is amazing. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know if anyone's seen it, but it's on the wall. It's in massive letters this high. And, you know, someone's gone out of the spray can just written like the Desert's Mr. Rain. In Ravenna, which is great. Um, no, it's fantastic when people notice your lyrics. And um, as I was, I was saying earlier, you know, one of the reasons I put lyrics in the book, I suppose, was to slightly fly the flag for myself as a lyric writer. Um, you can sometimes feel a bit overlooked, um, which I do sometimes. I do sometimes. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, there's nothing more ghastly than artists in any format really saying, oh, I'm so neglected, no one, no one pays me any attention. Um, but I would make a stronger claim for myself as a lyricist than I think I sometimes get. Yeah, you know, I'm just, just as, a, as a rule, you would write the words, the lyrics to everything but the girls' no, songs. No, that's not true at not all true. either. No, Ben wrote lots of them. I had a hilarious um, instance very early on, actually, so back in the 80s, when I went to do an interview on Woman's Hour, and they got me in specifically to talk about my very you know, feminist <coughs> lyrics, which I was thought, great, this is fantastic. And they sat down and read out a song that's written by Ben. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I'm yeah. just going to have to point out to you, yeah. I know we're live on air and it's going to really kill the whole <laughs> hope to this interview. <laughs> so, mm. so it's, it's the like the, the Jerry Goffin thing, isn't it? Writing a natural woman. Writing Absolutely, to which I thought woman. was, I watched that documentary about Carol King mm. and I actually had never quite registered that Jerry Goffin wrote the lyrics to Natural yeah. Woman and it made me see it in a whole new light and actually like it less. Yeah. Um, we'll yeah. talk about that another time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, now, how are we going? Uh, oh, golly. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, Samuel Beckett. I was wondering who, um, who are your favourite writers and do you feel they've influenced your lyrics in any way? Oh, God. I wouldn't dare say anyone's influence. That's awful, because then it sounds like you're going, I'm the love, Virginia <laughs> Woolf, and I'm just <laughs> as good as her. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it changes. I mean, I did always love Virginia Woolf at university. William Blake, I used to absolutely adore. Um, Anthony but again, Pohl, I haven't used read. To tell. Anthony Pohl's Dance of the Music yeah. of Time is a really big um, literary sort of milestone for me. Yeah, I, I reread them all quite regularly, yeah. which is a bit weird of me. Um, I like Evelyn War and P.G. Woodhouse, which are my sort of. P.G. Woodhouse, I read while well, Ben was in intensive care. So I still have memories of actually sitting next to him unconscious and reading P.G. Wood and laughing. And <laughs> people looking at me like, oh, it's awful. But, you know, you need something that's going to actually stop yeah, yeah. you going yeah. bonkers. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, okay. so those are some people I like. Uh, there's lots more, but I can't remember anyone. Okay. So, uh, another question, Tracy, about your wonderful lyrics. Um, as I sort of got into everything but the girl in the 80s uh, in tandem, I also got into Prefab Sprout. Mm. And uh, having McAloon in one of his lyrics said, refers himself to the Fred Astaire of words. Uh, and I wondered what your thoughts were on that. And <laughs> indeed, are there <laughs> other lyricists who you aspire to and say, I think they're, you know, fantastic? There are, yes, loads. There's these awful moments where people ask you and suddenly your mind goes completely blank. You can't remember anyone who's ever written any lyrics. During that period, were you very much aware of Prefab Sprout's work? Or yes. Yeah. Yes. I actually, I did, we did know Paddy a little bit at the time. And I do remember one of my great faux pas of all time was when I met him just after Steve McQueen had come out. Um, and, and went up to him and said, God, your new album's amazing, especially side one. And he said... Yeah, everyone's saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, side two's rubbish. Yeah. I was like, no, no, side two's really good as well. But I was just saying, like, oh, why did I say that? <laughs> yeah, Paddy's a great, great lyric writer. Um, whose lyrics are? Joni Mitchell's lyrics are unbelievable, right. I think. Um, quite hard to fault, really. Yeah. Also, I find that. Yours and Ben's lyrics are very similar. I mean, on Ben's new album... He copies me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tried to stop him, but... <laughs> on, on Ben's new when I'm writing, he looks over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I know, it's on his record. <laughs> on, on Ben's new album, Hendra, it's almost like you could have written the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you'd like to tell us? No, I am joking. <laughs> 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 We are just we've got one brain between us. That's all it comes to. How are we doing for time? Maybe time for a couple pounds, more? Yes, and then yeah. we should probably go and yeah. yeah. yes. um, I grew up the same time as you in London. And down with a younger colleague last week, going around looking at all the places where used used to go to gigs and where small bands could play. Mm. Those places have all gone. I wonder if you thought it's harder now for say someone in your situation with Marine Girls to have got going the way you did at the time. Yeah, I mean I think it's both harder and easier. That's the weird thing about the modern world. You know, it, it's, in some ways it's easier to do it all, but, you know, the internet's made it very easy to get your music, A, to record your music on, you know, home equipment and get it out there to people very easily. Um, I think there are still lots of little venues in London, perhaps not the same ones. The hardest thing is getting paid for anything, mm. absolutely anything, but, I mean, that is true in uh, many walks of life now, especially anything creative. But it's very difficult. You know, we, when we started, we didn't get paid much, but there was a sort of accepted understanding that if you did certain things, that was a, a job for which you would get paid. And that's gone out the window, which I think must make it very difficult. And obviously the fact that people um, can get their music for free, so why shouldn't they get their music for free? You know, persuading people to actually pay for something they can get free is a problem we didn't have. <laughs> mm. um, so I don't, I don't know how that battle is to be won. But. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Just the last one. Um, but how does it make you feel when you sing? And is what you felt when you were touring and singing professionally, is that different to how you feel when you sing now? Um. I have two different experiences of singing, really. One of them is in the studio, or, no, actually three, if I'm really honest. One of them is when I'm at home on my own, like just sitting at the piano or a guitar, writing a song or playing a song, when it's just a joy, just pure pleasure, you know, preferably no one else is in the house, because I still haven't actually changed from that person who didn't like being overheard. So still I'm happiest if I can sing at home on my own with no one else around, and that's just a pleasure. Second bit is singing in the studio, which I also really enjoy, but it's a little bit more tense because there are people around and there's an element of performance. But I do love recording. I find that really enjoyable. And then the third one is singing on stage, which for me has always been very fraught. And I do have memories of standing on a stage and enjoying it, but they're kind of fleeting memories. It's often there's a moment when it all clicks into place for a minute and everything's going very well. I can hear myself. You know, I'm feeling, well, my voice feels strong and it's all going great. So I, I, I can sort of summon up those memories, but it's not a constant feeling. So, you know, that's why I don't have 
lots of good um, positive memories about singing live. But as I say, there are other circumstances in which I sing where it is just a genuine pleasure. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's leave it on genuine <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yes, me not moaning. All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, just to let you know what's what's going to happen um, after we conclude, if you give us a minute, and um, Tracy will be outside and. Um, available to sign your copies of uh, Bedsit Disco Queen, either, I guess, ones you've brought or ones you've bought. Um, but just for now, I think the proper and um, moot, meet and fit thing to do <laughs> is to thank uh, Tracy uh, in the traditional way for coming to visit us today. So thanks very much. Thanks.